Good afternoon. My name is Ben Fisher. I'm a physician in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, the message I'm going to be delivering today via video is one that I was scheduled to give on March 15th at uh, White Memorial Presbyterian here in Raleigh. I was invited by Lisa Ogburn to give the talk. Uh, the title was to be The Pitfalls of Aging. And um, in the uh, days leading up to uh, that talk, uh, the coronavirus outbreak uh, was growing and uh, ultimately uh, the outbreak resulted in the cancellation of that talk. Uh, my initial reaction to that was one of, of great relief, honestly, as I'm one who does not by nature run to the stage, usually just the opposite. So it is uh, somewhat to my surprise that I find myself here today in front of the camera um, talking to you via this medium and at, at my own um, uh, volunteering to do so. And in the weeks that followed that scheduled talk, uh, I thought back over what I had intended to say and, and the conviction grew in me that, that what I was going to say had relevance, um, even more relevance in the time of this pandemic. And uh, without uh, egotism, I hope, I, my thoughts were that what I had to say mattered because my thoughts uh, were about patient stories that uh, are about what matters in our life and, and what matters particularly um, through the lens of approaching the end of our lives. So as we um, together go through this uh, coronavirus pandemic, I hope that what I have to tell you about today in some way contributes to the national conversation we're all having about what matters. And to the extent that I know about what matters, it is uh, from the privileged view that I have as a physician, that all physicians have. We have a front row view on the drama of human life. People come to us and share their sufferings with us, their, their griefs, their joys, and their pains. And it's not only physical suffering that comes to our attention. Many non-physical uh, problems result in physical suffering. So they uh, come to the door of the physician and, and we are invited in to suffer uh, with our patients in those things and to try to minister through them in, in some way, to try to help people. I'm grateful for that position in, in people's lives, for the opportunity it gives me to enter in and, and to seek to help in, in what ways I can. But I'm also grateful in another way in that it is a lesson in life for me. I get to bear witness to these dramas in, in many people's lives, and if I'm paying close attention, I can learn something from those and, and hopefully learn something about how to live my own life in, in, in light of the stories that I see unfolding. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you some stories today that, that come from my uh, own patients, and, and some of you may recognize these stories. I will tell you that I've asked permission of the families and of the patients to, to tell them. I will leave names out, but, um, but some of you may, of course, recognize the stories, and, and uh, just want to assure you that, that it is um, with advanced permission that I'm talking about them. Uh, at, in the days leading up to um, my talk, as I was thinking about the the Pitfalls of Aging, the intended title of my talk, my, my mind as a physician naturally went to the pitfalls that I had seen, the stories that I'm familiar with. And, and as I thought over those stories, a, uh, a theme kept coming up for me uh, over and over again. And, and, and the theme was connection, and particularly how connection uh, to, to each other, to our purposes, to God, even to ourselves, how those connections are of such importance and how they become even more highlighted in the declining years of our lives as we approach the end of our lives. And uh, it is negatively stated as disconnection becomes very manifest under those sorts of stresses. Disconnection um, or, or connection in that way is similar to character. It's, it's revealed under conditions of, of duress. 
And in our national time of duress here with the pandemic, we're, we're all thinking uh, about those connections and, and how they sustain us and, and about, again, about the things that matter in our lives. Um, as my talk was approaching, my wife read to me a, a few lines from a, from a book by Brene Brown entitled Daring Greatly. And uh, it, it was those words that, that my wife shared with me that really crystallized my thinking about, about this talk. And, and um, I'll, I'll read you those words. Brown writes, Connection is why we're here. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And without it, there is suffering. That line really crystallized my thinking about the comments that I was going to make and that I will make today. And, and uh, I'd say that I agree entirely with Brene Brown. And uh, from my privileged position as a physician, uh, I, I think that the stories that I will tell you will bear out that truth that she states. For the uh, first story, I'd like to tell you, I, I'm, I'm going to tell a story told by a storyteller way better than, than I could ever hope or dream to be. Uh, my favorite author, as, as any of my friends will know, is a writer named Wendell Berry. I've admired his writing for years, and uh, I'm uh, grateful to, to share that admiration with the beloved former pastor of White Memorial Presbyterian, Art Ross. And uh, Art Ross and I have, have had conversations about Wendell Berry that, that ultimately led him to share with me a, a sermon that he preached in 2006 on the same book that I'm going to tell the story from. The book is entitled Jaber Crow. And uh, I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from, from Art Ross's sermon about that, that book. So this is Art Ross speaking, saying, The texts I am preaching from today come from the Bible, but the illustrations come from the novel Jaber Crow. Such is the power of good literature. Good literature provides illustrations for the eternal truths of Scripture. Scripture is the text. Life, real life, real people, real events provide windows through which we see eternal truths. Wendell Berry writes novels that illustrate the eternal truths of Christian faith. I, I share that a view on Wendell Berry's writing with, with Art Ross, and, and Berry's fiction has had a deep impact on my life, um, teaching me about, about what sort of community I would like to live in, how I would like to, to treat people, how I would like to... Um, care for the people in my midst and, and uh, what type of relationships I would like to, to have with, with uh, the people around me. So I, I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, Jaber Crow. It's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit long, I will confess, and I hope in this time of, of uh, everybody being at home uh, that, that we may all have more time and be more patient to sit down and listen to a story than we might be at other times. Um, in this story, the characters I'll briefly tell you just because the names will come at you so you have some context. Uh, this, this is the story of a man named Athy Keith at the end of his life. He's uh, uh, one of the most beloved farmers in this small community, fictional community of Port William, Kentucky that Barry writes about. His uh, wife Della, his daughter Maddie appear in the story, and Jaber Crow, who is the town barber, appears. Also, you'll hear a little bit about Jimmy, his grandson, and Troy, his son-in-law, uh, with whom he does not have a great relationship. And here's the story, picking up on page 263. Athy began to suffer little strokes, no one of them was enough to bring him down. Little by little, they whittled him away. It happened slowly, but not so slowly that you couldn't see it happening. A kind of fumbling in both speech and motion grew upon him. It took him longer to make his daily trips to my shop, longer to get through the door. There were more times when he had to stand back from his work and let Jimmy do it alone. It was a blessing that Jimmy was willing and able. 
and then for a couple of days I didn't see Athy. It was early March, the weather mean, and I laid it on to that, though I couldn't remember when he had missed a day. The third morning, Maddie stepped into the shop. That was something unexpected and rare. For a moment, I was just sort of caught up by the beauty of it, and then I was afraid. I said, how's your dad? Not very well. I was afraid of that. I don't think he's going to be up for the trip, she said, for a while. I saw the moisture come into her eyes, and she blinked it away. So, Jaber, we were wondering if you could come to the house to shave him, maybe every couple of days, and cut his hair when he needs it. Would you mind? I said, I'd be glad to do it. You know I would. Yes, she said, I know you would. And so I knew that Athy had taken another step down. I knew more than that. I knew he was fighting for every scrap of independence he had left, not to be imposing on anybody. If he could no longer shave himself, Della or Maddie, either one could have shaved him and would have been glad to do it. But he didn't want them to do it. He didn't want to require that of them. They understood. If I did it, he could pay me and it would be all right. Also, they knew it would do him good to have the company. He would be glad to see me. I did as they asked. Every other day, usually late in the afternoon, I went to Della and Athy's house. Athy sat in a chair in the kitchen and I shaved him. When he needed a haircut, I brought my equipment and cut his hair. Always I tried to come when I didn't need to be in a hurry. When I finished my work, I would pull out a chair and sit down and Athy and I would talk. Mostly I talked. He was finding it hard. I told him the news. I saved up anything odd or interesting or funny so I could tell him. And he would nod or laugh or make a comment, usually only a word or two. Della and Maddie, if she was there, which she often was, would leave the kitchen to Affie and me until I had finished my work and we had had a visit. And then she or she and Maddie would come out and offer coffee and maybe cookies or a slice of pie and then sit with us and we would carry the conversation on a little further. Sometimes they would ask me to stay to supper. Sometimes Maddie and her two boys would stay for supper too and we would all sit down together. Sometimes Troy would be there, but not often and never for long. He was coming by dutifully, keeping up appearances. He didn't want to be there. Troy didn't want Affy to matter to him, didn't want to be bound to an old man dying couldn't bear to be enclosed by a house where death had, death had come as a patient guest. He shrugged it off like an ill-fitting jacket, calling over his shoulder without turning his head as he went out. Well, if you need anything, let me know. Jimmy came regularly in the mornings and evenings and did up the barn chores and hung about at other times when he could. The two of us patched together made Affy a sort of son-in-law come lately. And so for a while there, I took part in a little passage of family life and with a family I would have most chosen if I had had the choice. It was something I might have prayed for if I had thought of it, but it was not among the possibilities I had foreseen. It was just a good thing that came. You can imagine maybe what it meant to me to be acting almost as a family member and to be treated by Maddie as one who had been free, who had been in a way chosen, and who had something of use to offer. To have her feel free to ask me for help was to me freedom itself. It was strange that Athy's growing weakness should have brought forth so kind a pleasure to me, but it did. That grief should come and bring joy with it was not something I felt able or even called upon to sort out or understand. I accepted the grief, I accepted the joy, I accepted that they came to me out of the same world. Athy became less and less able for a while, just propping himself with his cane and dragging his feet out to the kitchen was a job that took a long time and a lot of rest afterward. And then he could manage that only with help, and then he couldn't manage it at all. He still insisted on getting up early in the morning and, with help, dressing as he always had in overalls and work shirt, though now he spent most of the day sitting in his chair. On Sundays, he wore his clean overalls and a shirt, and shirt, he wore over his clean overalls and shirt, a blue coat that had once belonged to a suit. He had become in body only a reminder of himself, bent and somehow loosened in form, weak and inexact in motion. His hands had become soft as cushions, the skin on the backs of them papery and pale. The women kept him clean. The room he sat or lay in was neat and bright. 
I kept him shorn and shaved and looking nice. We preserved his pride. He never complained. He was stubbornly principled, doing for himself the little and the less and less that he could do. And his eyes to the last looked back at you as they always had. I had known him well for 23 years. I had seen him change from a vigorous man whose thoughts were all of life to a man who knew he was dying and who still lived willingly and thoughtfully and humorously. As I carried my bits of news to him and did for him what I could, I had already begun to mourn him, as I saw that Della and Maddie had also. It got to be late April. It had some lovely weather. The woodlands were strewn with wildflowers and overhead were making shade. Everybody was busy about the fields and plant beds and gardens. The season had made its claim. And then there came a day of brittle feeling showers driven over the town by a cold wind that, after the warm days, seemed to come through your clothes in slices. I went to the back door as I always did and knocked twice and nobody answered. I opened the door and leaned in. The kitchen was empty. As a kitchen was apt to be at that time of day, it was cool and formal, full of the reduced mingled sm smells of seasonings and cold food. A cloth, as always, was spread over the things on the table. The chairs all shoved in at their places. There was a great pressure of silence in all the house. I called quietly, anybody home? And even more quietly, Della called back, in here, Jaber. I laid down my barbering to tools and tiptoed, suddenly full of knowledge, to Athy's room. It was the sitting room where they had moved in a bed for him when he could no longer climb the stairs. I stopped in the door. Della was standing on the far side of Athy's bed, holding his hand. He had felt poorly after dinner and had wanted to lie down for a nap, something he had resisted doing. She let him sleep a long time and then could not wake him. His eyes were open, but he was staring at nothing. She could not allow herself to leave him, even to call Maddie on the phone. She looked at me and shaped silently the words, He's going. The words tugged at her mouth, but she was not crying. Seeing me hesitate, she smiled and said, I'm glad you've come. I went over to the bed then and picked up Athy's other hand. He was breathing, but already he was not there. I could feel a small tremor in the hand I held. There was almost no pulse. We stood a while with him holding his hands, and then he ceased to breathe. The eyes have a light. They give a light. I saw it go out in Athy's. When the light had gone, Della, looking down, gently laid her fingers on his eyelids and closed them. She placed his hands together. She touched his forehead. When finally she looked up at me, the light of her own eyes seemed to startle and glitter in the air between us. And then, as her tears started to fall, she smiled and said, Well. Well, it's a beautiful story. I hope you find it as, as moving as I have found it. Um, I love the way uh, that the relationships become so apparent in, in Athie's dependence, a bit to me like the way a, a spider web shows up in the morning dew. You can see in, in greater detail the relationships that have made and, and sustained his life. And um, the way that, that life is described in that chapter gave me um, an aspiration for how I would like to conduct my life as a, as a physician. I, I have, my heart has yearned to doctor in the way that Jaber Crow barbered. Um, and um, I found it difficult to, um, I found it difficult to do that in my work, and it's required um, some difficulty to get to that uh, point where I could even uh, begin to aspire to it. Um, you know, the the world tends to push in the other direction. We are pushed in the medical profession towards efficiency and cost containment, uh, worthy ends uh, to some degree, but ends that tend to exclude relationship. Um, as I would uh, watch myself and my partners become uh, driven to act more and more uh, like robots on an assembly line in the way we conducted my uh, our work, I knew that uh, connection was being lost and sacrificed somehow in, in the midst of uh, 
in the midst of all that drive for efficiency. And uh, as I think about uh, Jaber Crow and, and Athy Keith, uh, I also appreciate there in the end of his life, the, the fidelity to role that, that each uh, character in that story maintains. So uh, Della and, and Maddie uh, maintain the role that only they can play to love and care for their husband and father in the way that only a wife and, and daughter can do. Similarly, Jaber Crow uh, was allowed to continue to play his role in his life, uh, the role of, of barbering, and it's notable that that, that was the role that Athi also wanted him to play. And while we don't hear about it in this excerpt of the story, in, in other chapters and places, we do hear about the, the pastor and the doctor, and, and it can be assumed and understood that that they were coming and, and, and playing their appropriate roles in that life as well. Whereas um, Jaber Crow um, gave me an imagination for how I might strive to live and, and to carry out my work, I'd I'd like to tell a, um, a counter story that, uh, that for me uh, stands as, as an example of how it becomes, has become difficult in our time to see our way uh, to the possibility of, of living and dying in the way uh, Barry describes in this book. And so this, this, this story takes place a number of years ago before I moved to Raleigh between the time that I finished my active duty stint in the uh, Navy Medical Corps and, and before I came to Raleigh and assumed the, uh, the practice of Dr. Bob Bilbro, for whom I'm uh, forever grateful uh, for the opportunity that he has uh, given me. Uh, so I was working in those in-between years um, as a hospitalist, and uh, you may be familiar with that term. That's uh, a doctor who only works in the hospital and uh, who acts as the primary care doctor for hospitalized patients. So, so meaning that you um, hospitalists assess uh, the nature of the problem and then coordinate the response to it, uh, enlisting other specialists, hospital uh, staff, whatever's needed to, to resolve the problem, but uh, plays the, the quarterback role in, in that. And that's, uh, hospitalists have become the, the, uh, the norm over the last 20 years or so uh, prior to that, uh, primary care doctors took care of their own hospitalized patients, and we'll, we'll touch on that a, a little bit later. But I, I, I was working as a hospitalist, and I was taking on a, a new caseload of patients, and, and the patient uh, who uh, I'll talk about was a, I had a chance to review his file before going into the room. This is a man who had lung cancer that was widely metastatic. It was affecting nearly every organ system in his body. He had been through all the available treatments and despite uh, all treatment, the disease was progressing. He was cared for by a host of specialists attending to uh, every malfunctioning body system that he had. The uh, uh, review of the chart uh, painted for me a, a grave picture of a, of a man near the end of his life and that picture was confirmed uh, for me when I walked in the door and um, saw a man who was uh, unable to speak, who was laboring to breathe with a little bit of lung he had remaining, was emaciated, and uh, was in a, just in a terrible state of health. He was surrounded by many family members, um, some evidently children and, and um, presumably his wife as well, and a multi-generational uh, gathering in this room. And uh, when I went in the room, I, I um, I thought that I would probably be having a, a, a commiseration sort of conversation about uh, um, being sorrowful for the, for the condition of the patriarch of this family and immediately picked up on a, on a great uh, tension in the room. And uh, when I endeavored to find common ground from which to start a, a conversation in this uh, charged environment, uh, I uh, made reference to the uh, grave nature of his illness and his nearness to death. And uh, that, um, 
that statement uh, uh, prompted an immediate and furious response from the family as they um, uh, chastised me for even suggesting that he might die, uh, uh, immediately requested that I be uh, taken off the case, which I was, and essentially uh, chased me out of the room. And uh, you know that, that story, while a brief interaction for me, I was relieved from the case and, and no longer involved, ha has been one that has stayed with me and that I have uh, chewed on and thought about for, for a lot of my professional life. I think it, um, in, although an extreme example of how um, we approach death sometimes in our modern medical context, uh, uh, I have found that some aspects uh, or some assumptions that were shared by the people in that room are, are shared by um, almost every patient uh, who I've encountered since and, and family, uh, family of the patients that I have cared for as they uh, approached and, and, and ultimately died. Um, and I would like to, to draw out uh, some of those assumptions and, and um, reflect on how they may rob us of the opportunity to stay connected uh, to the people we love uh, as they age and decline. The, um, I think the, the chief assumption that I would draw attention to here is, is that uh, death is to be uh, fought and resisted at all and every cost. And further, that, that death is not uh, natural and inevitable, but rather that de death in our time is only a result of a technical failure or in um, suboptimal application of omnipotent technologies. Um, the, uh, the death that we die today is preventable by tomorrow's medicine, I think is is an assumption that, that many of us hold to be true. And, and we in the medical profession are to some degree responsible for, uh, for promoting that uh, myth, or if not a myth, that, that overstatement. Uh, we have um, contributed to the hubris uh, that we share in, uh, of our technological capabilities uh, within the medical uh, realm and sphere. We, we have begun to think that, that uh, we can surmount any illness uh, and um, we are learning through this coronavirus epidemic that, the, that there are illnesses that are more serious than our powers. Um, one of my fears of, of how we might grapple in the end with this illness in the after action review is that we'll, we will again fail to recognize that and and come to believe that, that any and all deaths that have been suffered and will be suffered in this illness are a result of technical incompetence. Certainly there are things that we could have and, and uh, should have done differently and better, and we should learn those lessons, but uh, we should also learn um, or relearn what we once knew, that uh, death is the natural end of all of our lives. And uh, while I may, uh, while that does not absolve me of, of uh, the responsibility to be as diligent as I can be as a physician, uh, it um, does not absolve me of that responsibility, uh, but it does mean that uh, if death is an inevitability, then my role is more than just as a mere technician. Um, the, the technical competence of a physician is, uh, is sufficient only if we are immortal beings. Um, and uh, if, uh, if we are uh, mortal, then we need more than just a mechanic. We need somebody who will, um, who will share in our suffering, will enter into it, who will help guide us through it, and will help us to know uh, when it is time, uh, when it is time to surrender, right? The um, uh, I think that uh, that 
that is part of the key role of, of a physician, but it's a, a role that is often missed and overlooked in our, in our time. Um, the, so let's look at what are the, uh, the costs of, of the denial of, of the possibility of, of death that this unfortunate lung cancer patient uh, faced. Um, what, what did it uh, rob the patient and the family of? It, number one, it, it uh, robbed them of any peace. There, there was no peace in, in that room that I entered. There was only tension, only fear. Uh, and I would contrast that to the to the room where Athi Keith uh, was staying, uh, where there was a hush and a calm and, and an ability to be to be quiet in the face of of what was inevitable um, if uh, if we opened our eyes to what was happening. Um, the um, the other cost is that the reaction to the uh, while I was not present when the a uh, lung cancer patient passed away. The only um, option for that family uh, was to be upset and uh, uh, frustrated at the technical incompetence uh, or perceived technical incompetence of the people who, who proved unable to fix him. Um, and that is, um, again, a, uh, a response that I... Uh, Fear will inform the way that we look at, at uh, the current uh, pandemic um, and, and focus overly much on, on um, what was done wrong uh, rather than on, um, on the, the human suffering that, uh, that, that we share in through it. Um, another loss for the family is that they had no time um, to mourn the patient. And you notice the mourning started with Athi Keith before his uh, death. And, and uh, uh, this unfortunate family had, had no opportunity to mourn um, right up until the moment that he died because every moment was uh, occupied by trying to shoo away death um, until it, there was just no way to do so uh, any further. Um, also, they were, uh, perhaps most importantly, for me, what I take away is that they were not able to play their roles. So the, uh, the wife was present, some of the children were present. Uh, the love that um, we hope they shared uh, was not able to be demonstrated in that time because they were not occupying the role of loving husband and daughter. Instead, they were occupying the role of doctor. It, it really, in, in the absence of any uh, any doctor who was present th from the family, with the family from beginning to end, who could help them um, in a way that, that the technicians who were caring for him could not. Um, without that, they were playing that role and they were advocating and pushing and, and their conversation was an entirely technical instead of entirely relational and, and loving. Um, and I, I see that uh, I see that to some extent in, in every uh, patient encounter I, I have had and professionally with, with, with uh, people who are approaching death. And um, I have, in the best circumstances, I've been able to help the family members to relax and realize that they, that they had a doctor and, and that they um, could relax into that and, and allow themselves to be uh, spouse and uh, daughter and son and, and friend uh, rather than a technical advisor. And how did the um, medical profession uh, interact with this patient, uh, the lung cancer patient, uh, to contribute to the lack of peace and, and the uh, uh, tension that, that the family had to suffer through in addition to the physical suffering of, of the of the dying man. Uh, I, th I think the, the the medical profession allowed the family to maintain the illusion that that death was um, could be cheated uh, entirely and death could be avoided. Uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, technical and specialist advisors, but there did not seem to be anybody there who was who was 
present for the whole story and really talking about um, uh, this man's life rather than his individual parts. And um, I recognize in my own reflection on it the limitations of, of my role there. And uh, uh, while I pronounced uh, what I think was a truth, this man is dying, I, I pronounced that uh, with uh, having not earned the right to pronounce it. Right? I was somebody who had never been present for this man's uh, earlier illness and suffering. The family did not know me. They had no basis for trust with me. I uh, reviewed the chart and looked at the man and, and, and made that declaration. Um, and while true, they, couldn't, they could not hear that truth from me. Um, the, I think that highlights a, uh, a limitation of our current hospitalist uh, system uh, there are many very good and, and uh, diligent hospitalists doing, doing good work, but they don't have the opportunity to have that relationship that, that gives them the right to speak. And uh, it ultimately uh, points to me to, the, to uh, the limitation of efficiency as the main characteristic of medical medical work that makes it valuable. That is uh, what is often held up as the highest end of, of medical work, but um, efficiency uh, tends to exclude relationship because relationships are not efficient. Relationships require time, they require uh, love and care, and um, they are more about nurturing than they are about fixing we have a healthcare system that is bent on fixing us, but it has forgotten that mortal beings uh, need more than fixing. We need care. And I, I don't have all the answers to that, but I know that we need to not elevate efficiency to the high honor that, that we have in the way that we think about uh, the planning of our health policy. In contrast to that uh, story, uh, I think about another story uh, more recently in my medical work that that um, tells a different story. This this is a patient uh, who I've known for um, all the time that I've been in practice here in Raleigh. Uh, prior to my coming to town, he had suffered a, a very serious heart condition, had had heart attack, and then subsequent um, near lethal arrhythmias. He had been resuscitated and survived all that and somewhat against all odds had had a, a real flourishing for the next uh, 20 or so years of his life. Um, he and I uh, had shared time together at the YMCA where he'd come with me to uh, participate in a health restoration program that we do uh, in collaboration with the Y. I'd seen him um, getting needed weight off, becoming fit and, and really um, having a, a wonderful um, a wonderful season of life and, uh, and, and a season of life that I got to to some degree share with him. Uh, but then uh, a couple of years back, he, on a hot August day, was walking up a hill at a funeral and, and became profoundly short of breath. That uh, ultimately revealed uh, the presence of a worsening of his heart condition uh, and attempts at treating his Heart, worsening heart condition were complicated by a simple and common urological problem where he had uh, urinary tract uh, obstruction, could not urinate. That ultimately led to a serious um, urinary tract infection, which led to, to uh, near-fatal sepsis. And uh, he, again, uh, survived against all odds. This man was incredibly resilient and, and strong to overcome um, health challenges, uh, but this one ultimately took uh, more out of him than, than, than could be endured. He, he did survive that hospitalization, but his heart was greatly weakened by the, the infection. And over the next uh, uh, few months, which were a very hard series of months for the patient and the, and the family, he, he had uh, numerous heart setbacks and 
and uh, kind of a revolving door of, of hospital admissions. And as um, I had had the opportunity and the privilege of, of being with the patient and both in health and then throughout this uh, journey of, of sickness, as I had been acting as his, both his outpatient doctor and his hospitalist in this setting. We did not have a hospitalist. I was admitting him and caring for him in the hospital. I, I'd seen him through all this difficult season and I had, in contrast to the, to the lung cancer patient, I had earned the right to speak um, and to share with the family that, that we were uh, nearing the end and that uh, this was going to continue to spiral into to more and more difficult situations and and um, what was already hard on the patient was going to get harder. Um, and we were able to decide together that it was time for hospice. And thanks to the wonderful Transitions Hospice inpatient facility, he was uh, transferred there. Um, the last um, day that I saw this uh, man, he was uh, holding, holding court uh, as he often did. He had a large gathering of family around him. It was a beautiful spring day. The doors were open, you could see to the garden, uh, and he was entertaining and enjoying the company of, of, um, of all these folks. And um, he died shortly thereafter. The uh, family, of, of course, uh, grieved and, and mourning appropriately, um, as, as I was and as I always am in, in the um, uh, sharing of, of grief. Uh, with these patients um, who, I've, who I've known for years. Um, but the family ultimately, although it was hard at the time, in, in retrospect, uh, uh, sees and is, is grateful for the, um, for the opportunity uh, that the patient had to maintain connection um, at the end of his life. The... Um, Another story um, that's been an encouragement to me and, and is a kind of a modern day telling of the Athie Keith story is, um, is a story that gives me hope that that, um, that way of living and, and dying is, is um, still attainable in, in our time. So this is um, um, a patient who's, whose daughter uh, called me on a Saturday evening saying, you know, my dad's not quite right. He's kind of stumbling and he's not quite um, thinking as straight as he has been before. There's something off and a little different um, since it was not uh, an acute uh, uh, overnight sort of situation. I said, I, I, well, let's have a look at your dad tomorrow um, to bring him to the office in the afternoon and, and we'll um, we'll see what's happened. It sounds like he may have had uh, a series of, of minor strokes. Um, so I, I saw him the next day, and indeed he was um, clearly not the, the person who I had known before through the years, and, and I continued to suspect that, that perhaps he had had um, uh, some strokes as Afi had, admitted him to the hospital, and unfortunately got a call from the radiologist that night saying it's not a stroke, he has a, a, a brain tumor. And uh, so we saw him through in the subsequent uh, weeks and months, um, saw him through surgery to remove the tumor and, and radiation that, that followed. And through all that, there were, um, of course, numerous uh, difficult times and, and complications. Um, the patient, uh, was able to go home sometimes, but uh, at other times became um, too ill to stay home and needed to be readmitted to the hospital. Uh, throughout all that journey, which I had the privilege of being present for, the uh, I met all of the extended family. I had known his um, daughter and son-in-law well already, but then met his other three children and, and got to know his wife. and. Uh, it has been a privilege throughout that time to to see their devotion to each other, to see the web of relationships that this man has with his family and his community that are highlighted like the like the dew on a spider web. 
Um, and this um, patient I'm describing is, is entirely rooted in this community. He uh, has a long uh, history of service to the community and, and uh, the work that he did here. Um, and his desire was to stay in this community. Uh, I, I knew that was his desire and was able to, to shepherd the course of the evaluation such that he could stay here for his treatment. Um, and his main desire has been that uh, his suffering would not, uh, or the, the troubles that he was having would not bring undue trouble on the people around him. All that uh, care and concern that the patient had for for the people who cared for him, and the care and concern that the um, that the people in his life had for him, and and the opportunity that I had in the midst of that uh, to be invited in uh, was uh, is continues to be a a source of great joy that comes to me that I that I might have prayed for had I thought of it. But instead, I just uh, receive it as Jaber Crow did, as as a blessing. And um, for me, as a as a physician, the 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 blessing of seeing those stories and and now sharing those that story with you um, is that this man and his family, in in his suffering, uh, remind us all um, how to how to. Um, how to go through difficult circumstances and times in our lives without having the difficult circumstances rob us of the things that are uh, most defining to us and shape our lives, um, the, the relationships um, that we have uh, with the people we love. And um, I'd like to, um, the last story I'd like to share with you is, is um, is a beautiful love story. And this is a story that I dedicate to all the patients I have who are widowed and, and living life alone for, and for whom their aloneness has become uh, so much more acute during this uh, pandemic. My, my thoughts uh, go out to those uh, people and, um, and this story I think uh, will be an encouragement to those of you as as it has been an encouragement to me. So this is a story of two people who met as um, uh, youngsters in a very small uh, North Carolina rural town. Uh, they fell in love. Uh, they married young. They uh, raised a family. She became a school teacher. He became an engineer. Um, in the uh, course of life, they uh, subsequently became very involved in the lives of their grandchildren. Um, they were involved uh, deeply in the life of their church and in their community at large. Um, as they turned towards the older years of their lives, uh, her uh, chronic um, back trouble uh, that she had became more and uh, more and more of a problem, and this was subsequently compounded by a development of a of a uh, type of chronic leukemia that over time became worse. Those two conditions contributed over time to a to a decline in her health that um, um, involved a, a good deal of suffering um, at at times, um, but that was. Uh, marked at all times by his, uh, her husband's devoted and loving attention. I have never known a better nurse than um, this man was to his wife. Uh, he loved her um, so well through all those times. Uh, I remember uh, one time he was lifting her and tore his bicep. Every time I would see him with this sort of bulging uh, bicep. It was a uh, from from where it had torn. It was a, a visible manifestation to me of his sacrifice and and care for her as um, as she became more uh, ill over time. He recognized that that what he could do for her was was not going to be enough. And in his foresight, he he um, had them move to a continuing care community where she could get needed 
uh, attention from from nurses um, when uh, when the circumstances require that, and um, ultimately um, uh, she did uh, succumb to her illness and 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 passed away, um, which uh, was a a source of, of suffering, and her husband, um, and my patient, suffered uh, appropriately and grieved her loss. Uh, but he cherishes his her memory in a way that um, that that is beautiful um, and and encouraging. And when I asked his permission uh, to tell this story, he he sent me. A message back uh, with with his permission and, and also uh, this addendum to the story. I'll read his words. He writes, I want to share something else with you about Francis, uh, and he did allow me to use the names. I want to share something else with you about Francis and me that I feel may be important about our story for your audience to hear. There is an element of losing a spouse in death that can sustain the surviving spouse with hope and promise. Because of my devotion to Frances, in death as in life, I try each day to honor her life and her memory. I do not think of my life now as living alone without Frances, but as living with her in memory and telling her story so that future generations in our family will know her as I did. This is another type of connection in whatever form it may take that can sustain the surviving spouse and give purpose, meaning, and hope to the remaining years of life and the promise of a reunion to come. What a, uh, a, a beautiful testimony uh, to life and to love and um, to how the uh, dead remain with us in our hearts and, and in our memories. And here is as uh, Christians together at, at uh, uh, this talk, which I'm addressing to a Christian community here on the cusp of Easter, uh, we can think about that together uh, and and think about death in in a um, in a way that that involves grief, but also um, involves love. Uh, and you know, for me, one of the uh, the proofs of Christianity if, if, um, is that, that Christ can live in all of our hearts. Um, uh, just as, as the people we have loved stay alive in all of our hearts. And um, it is that, um, that which takes the sting of death away. And uh, if we recognize that and, and we know that, that truth that love is greater than death, um, then we need not fear death. And uh, we need not chase away uh, love uh, out of uh, uh, devotion to chasing away death. We certainly should uh, do all that we can to care for each other. Uh, I, as a physician, and all physicians should do all we can do to care for life and, and to, to preserve life when, when it is right and proper to do so, uh, but also to help our patients um, to see when it is right and proper to let go. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope that some of those stories in, in my amateur way and in Wendell Berry's professional way as a writer um, tell um, tell stories that that give um, that demonstrate truths that we all know intellectually that but that we can um, forget about uh, when we're in the grips of uh, mortal fear and um, it is um, I hope that um, I hope these stories uh, help you to remember that that it is the relationships in our lives that give them uh, weight and, and shape and meaning and that we must uh, preserve and attend to those key relationships in our lives at all stages of our lives, but it is in the uh, decline and towards the end of our lives that, that they will become uh, so important and that those connections will become so vital to us. And, 
And as we age, um, that is my primary counsel uh, to all of you, to maintain uh, your connections and to maintain uh, the, uh, the centrality of those connections to your life. Um, that that uh, the physical end of our lives is not the drama. So often it is mistaken to be the drama, uh, chasing it away, shooing it out the door, not letting death in at all costs and at any cost is, is the dramatic telling of the end of our lives in, in this um, technical way of dying that is now the, the predominant paradigm in our world. Um, but it is um, the end of the story is always known. The, um, uh, the end of the story is that, that all of us will die. So that can't be the drama. The, the drama is uh, taking place in the relationships that, that sustain us and make our lives. And, and as we live our lives, I exhort all of us to, to live them in a way that makes our stories uh, a story worth telling, um, just as the, last, as the last story I told and, and others, the, those stories that I told that are an encouragement uh, for how we should live. May, may we live lives uh, that will be an encouragement to the people that come after us. Thank you for listening today, and, and I hope this is um, helpful to you. Thank you.